Hello spooky people and welcome back to the channel and happy Halloween week. We're going to kick off Halloween week by doing the local haunts book tag. Now I spoke about local haunts in my October TBR, but if you didn't catch that video, I'll just give you a brief recap here. Local Haunts is an anthology of spooky short stories compiled and edited by Regina St. Clair, and the contributors are all here on BookTube and more specifically on HorrorTube. I'll have everyone's information linked down below. Please go out and pick up Local Haunts. It's a really, really great book. This tag was created by Dane Cobain over at Dane Reads, and I'll also leave his original video linked down below. So I thought I would take this opportunity to tell you some spooky short ghost stories from my hometown in St. John's, Newfoundland. Now, I currently do not live in St. John's. I live in Calgary, Alberta but St. John's will always be my home, and with it being one of the oldest cities in North America, founded in 1497, the province has a rich history of storytelling and specifically spooky stories. So I'm going to do this tag a little bit differently than other people have. Other people have had a lot of book recommendations as part of their tag, but I'm gonna take this opportunity to do every single question revolving around a spooky story from St. John's Newfoundland. Are you ready to get spooked? Number one, local haunts. Tell us a spooky tale about a place close to you. Again, this is not a place that's physically close to me, but it's a place that will always be in my heart. And I'm going to tell you the story about the Bell Island Hag. So Bell Island, Newfoundland is a very, very small island, just a stone's throw away from St. John's, and you can get there very quickly just having a short ferry ride going out of Portugal Cove. Now, Bell Island is known as Canada's X-File Island because of all of the spooky happenings that happen there. Everything from ghosts to fairies to UFO sightings, strange occurrences, but most popularly is the story of the Bell Island Hag. Now, she is also known as the Woman in White, and she is seen in the bog or the marshlands on the island. Residents will first see her as a beautiful woman dressed in white out in the boglands. And as she begins to draw them nearer, she falls to her knees, her entire body begins to change, and her skin starts to slough off of her bones. But the worst part of this all is the unbearable stench that she emits. As she gets nearer and nearer, her victim will become paralyzed by her grotesque appearance and that god-awful stench. And they will start to feel her crawl on top of them. And people who have this encounter, when they come back to civilization, they're never quite the same afterward. And all they can remember is a paralyzing fear and her sitting on top of them with her stench. And this forever changes them. Now, no one knows who the Bell Island Hag really is, but there is a story that back during war times, a young lady was a witness to a crime and fearing that she would go back to the village and tell on the perpetrators, they took her into the bog and killed her. And that's not the worst part of the story. The residents all closed their windows against her screams because they thought it was the fairies playing a trick on them to lure them into the bog. So it is said that her vengeful spirit now roams the bog lands of Bell Island, pulling in witless victims and scaring them half to death to where they are never the same again. Number two, a stone's throw. Tell us a story about a young female character who has had a tough life. For this, I would like to tell you the story of the ghost of Catherine Snow. Catherine lived a very hard life in Outport, Newfoundland as a wife and the mother of seven children. But even more so than the hardships of living life in an Outport rural area, Catherine's husband, Mr. Snow, 
was an abusive tyrant, and he often raised his hand to Catherine. When Mr. Snow was out of the house, Catherine's cousin, Tobias Mandeville, often called on her and comforted and cared for her in her husband's absence. Like many other small towns, a rumor soon started to spread that Catherine and Tobias were having a love affair and they wanted to get rid of Mr. Snow. One evening, Mr. Snow came home and found Tobias and Catherine together and a fight broke out, a huge argument and Mr. Snow left the house never to be seen again. The townsfolk started to discuss that Catherine and Tobias had done away with Mr. Snow, and not long after, blood had been found on a fishing stage down by the docks, and it was determined that Catherine and Tobias had killed Mr. Snow and dumped his body in the ocean. Tobias was arrested right away, but Catherine managed to escape into the wilderness surrounding her little town. She spent days on the run living off the wilderness, but she was also pregnant with her eighth child, and close to starving to death, she turned herself in. Tobias and Catherine were brought to St. John's where they were tried for murder and convicted by an all-male jury and sentenced to death by the judge. Catherine being pregnant was allowed to live out her days, but as soon as she was delivered of the baby, she was hung from a window in the courthouse. Her body left there to rot as a lesson to onlookers. Soon after Catherine was cut down and buried, her spirit began to wander in the courthouse. She could be seen in the window from where she was hung, on stairwells, and walking back and forth through hallways. Even when the courthouse burnt down years later and was rebuilt, Catherine's ghost continued to wander the hallways of the new courthouse, and she continues to wander until this day. Some believe it, it's because she was wrongly accused, and some say that it's because she is looking for her lost baby. Number three, Crowthorn. Tell us a story about a harmful friendship. So for this one, I would like to tell you the story about the final duel. Newfoundland was often fought for between the British and the French, but even during times of peace, British soldiers would be stationed on the island, and they would often spend their time caring for each other and having friendly games of cards. One night, an officer came into the barracks and noticed an ensign in the corner loading a rifle, which was not safe practices. And when he approached the ensign, he slowly turned around and revealed not only did he have a fatal bullet wound in his head, but it was also the specter of someone that the officer knew was killed a month prior. So prior to this, the young ensign, just 17 years old, was having a friendly game of cards with one of the officers in his unit. He continued to lose poorly, and even down to his last shillings, placed a bet and lost everything. He had been stripped of a full month's wages. In his anger, he accused the officer of theft, and the officer challenged the young man to a duel, which was often how problems were settled in the infantry. Duels didn't have to be fatal. They could just wound instead of kill. But on the next morning, when the two walked away from each other and turned, the officer shot the young ensign right between the eyes, killing him instantly. But soon after, with a guilty conscience, the officer began seeing the spirit of the young ensign and slowly descended into madness. No one knows what happened to that officer. He eventually faded from the record. But only months after this young ensign's death, dueling was outlawed by the British military. The base is now long gone, but residents of the area still claim to see the spirit of the young ensign with the horrible head wound. Number four, screen eight. Tell us about a movie that scared you that's based on a true story. And for this one, I am going to pick Annabelle. Now this movie is done in very, very broad strokes and really has not much to do with the original story. But whether we're talking about the original story or the fictional story of Annabelle, the fact that an inhuman spirit can possess a vessel like a doll terrifies me to the bone. I have had many experiences with earthbound spirits, but it's the inhuman spirits that truly terrify me. If you want to learn more about Annabelle, please check out thewarrens.net and watch this film. It is creepy good. Number five, The Mount of Death. Bear me. 
tell us about a story where drink plays a role in the plot. So I want to tell you about the hauntings of the Newman Wine Vaults in St. John's, Newfoundland. Newfoundland, as part of the British Empire in the 19th century, often had exports of codfish. And in this instance, the codfish, which was plentiful in the waters surrounding Newfoundland, was brought to Portugal. And the ships would come back loaded with port wine that would be cured in barrels at the Newman Wine Vaults in St. John's before being shipped back to the homeland in Britain. This was a very lucrative and successful business for the Newman family and for the workers in St. John's. The Newman wine vaults still stand and it is a popular place for tours, weddings, and social functions. And visitors who take pictures in the wine vaults often catch the ghosts of the workers dressed in their work garb, still curing that wonderful port wine that would be sent back to Britain. Number six, the blocked cellar. Tell us about your favorite horror, paranormal, or true crime YouTube channel. And for this, I want to give a shout out to the official Ed and Lorraine Warren YouTube channel. This is run by Tony Spera, who was the Warrens' son-in-law. He has inherited the Warrens' business, the occult museum that they ran, and NESPR, which is the paranormal research group that was founded by Ed Warren. There are many instructional videos on this channel, but I particularly enjoy watching the old vintage episodes of Seekers of the Supernatural. Please make sure to go over and check out the official Ed and Lorraine Warren YouTube channel. Number seven, The Night Watchman. Tell us a story that is set partly at night. And for this, I would like to tell you the story of the ghost of Matthew Trilligan. Matthew Trilligan was just barely what would be considered a man at the time, just a teenager really. And he had recently taken a job as a sailor and was about to set sail on a merchant ship. Before he left though, he wanted to marry his young love, Kathleen. The two wed in a small ceremony and at the reception, the other sailors' wives were chatting to Kathleen about being married to a sailor was being married to loneliness, heartache, and worry. Upon hearing this, Matthew came into the room and swore that if he were to die at sea, Kathleen would not only be the first to know, but he would come back for her. Playing along, Kathleen said if he were to come back for her in death, she would gladly go with him. After the wedding, young Matthew set sail, and Kathleen settled into her life as a sailor's wife. She was often seen going down to the docks and looking out at the ocean, as if willing Matthew's ship to come home. The days and weeks and months passed, and there was no word from Matthew's ship. Until one night, one of the Trilligan's neighbors was sitting at a window, and in looking outside, she saw someone coming up the lane. As he approached, she noticed that it was young Matthew Trilligan, but he didn't look right. He had an ethereal way to him and his skin was pale and gray. She watched him go into his home and a few moments later, he came out carrying Kathleen. She was smiling and giggling. And as the two walked down the lane, the neighbor noticed that Kathleen also now had an ethereal appearance and her skin was pale and gray like Matthew's. And as they walked into the mists, the two disappeared. The neighbor went over to the Trilligan's house and upstairs to the bedroom where she found young Kathleen dead in her bed, soaked from head to toe in seawater and smelling of seaweed. It appears that young Matthew Trilligan kept his promise and his bride went with him to death willingly. Number eight, alone among the gum trees. Tell us a story about a place in the wilderness. And for this, I want to tell you the story of Kelly's Island. Like Bell Island that we spoke of before, Kelly's Island is only a stone's throw from St. John's and is a very, very small island that is uninhabited. Back centuries ago, Captain Ambrose John Kelly was stationed in Newfoundland, and although a British sailor, he descended into piracy. 
he stationed himself on the small island just off the shores of St. John's. And from there he would surprise other ships and rob them of their booty, keeping it for himself. It is said that some of Captain Kelly's treasure is still buried on the island. Word of the captain's piracy made it back to the British Empire, and he was dealt with and executed. The small island from where he worked was forever known as Kelly's Island afterwards. There are many in Newfoundland who will be willing to bring you to Kelly's Island, but few of them will stay with you, and even fewer will stay overnight. There, of course, have been some foolish visitors who have dared to spend the night on Kelly's Island, and they have said that they were tormented by a tall man all dressed in black. And the next morning these visitors would quickly flee. Buried treasure has never been discovered on the island, but people still speak of the tall, dark specter of Captain Kelly, who is still guarding his booty. Number nine, Highway to Hell. Tell us a story involving music. Now music, as well as storytelling, is deeply ingrained in the traditions of Newfoundland and Labrador. One popular pastime for centuries has been kitchen parties, where local residents would gather, eat, drink, play music, and dance until the wee hours of the morning. Not long ago, a band from St. John's had a gig in Bonavista Bay. They made a road trip out of it and decided to rent a house to stay for a few days. After their musical gig and on the first night in the house, they all went upstairs and went to sleep. Each was awoken in the middle of the night by the sounds of music coming up from the kitchen. At the time, however, they just thought it was other members of the band who had stayed up late and were playing music downstairs. But upon discussing this the next morning, they realized that none of the band members had stayed up late, but all of them had heard the music coming from the kitchen. After hearing this, some of the band members decided to pack up and leave early, but a few of the members decided to stay the extra night that they had already paid for. On that night, they also heard the music coming up from the kitchen, but this time it seemed to be a full-blown kitchen party, and this went on all night long. When the sun came up, the rest of the band members quickly packed up and left the house behind. It seems that even in death, residents of these small communities are still throwing kitchen parties. Question 10, at the end of the rope. Tag some booktube and or horror tube friends. As you probably know, I'm very new to booktube, but I do have a couple of people that I would like to tag here. First, Lisa over at Pink Paradox Reads. Second, Rachel from The Shades of Orange. And third, A.B. Frank from The Bookish Report. I invite you all to answer these questions. Doing this video was really, really fun. So that's all for now. Happy Halloween week, and thank you so much for watching. But until next time, stay spooky, guys. Bye.